Every eight weeks ought to be self-supporting, declining outside contributions. We will now pass the basket. This is a weekly step meeting. Our format is as follows. A speaker is asked to talk for 25, 30 minutes on the step of that week, followed by discussion or questions until 7 p.m. You can find these weekly meetings on our YouTube page, the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Doylestown. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe, and share. That brings us to the speaker portion of the meeting on this day, the 6th of March, uh, 2023, in Doylestown, PA, at the Monday night 6 p.m. Stay Alive Literature and Step Group at St. Paul's Lutheran Church. Tonight's speaker is Jimmy, and he will be sharing his experience on step three. Please help me welcome Jimmy. Thank you, and uh, my name's Jimmy, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, hey Jimmy. Jimmy. Thanks for having me at your group. I appreciate it, and uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess my story starts pretty much the same way I think everybody's story starts. Uh, uh, we, uh, my family's from Kensington, my extended family's from Kensington. Uh, we moved from Kensington when I was young to the Northeast Parkwood. And uh, I think my parents' plan was at that time was to get us out of the bad area so maybe the cycle would be broken, but that didn't work out too well because half of Kensington moved to Parkwood also. Uh, my home, I, I sincerely think my home was not dysfunctional, but I was in a dysfunctional neighborhood, and everybody I hung out with was dysfunctional. Uh, even before uh, I picked up a beer, I was, I was already arrested for shoplifting and robbing cars and doing stuff. Um, I wasn't... I wasn't the guys going to Cub Scouts and, and, and organized sports and, you know, my father, he was a good guy. He was a, he was a fireman and, you know, he, he did not break the law. He didn't go for any of that stuff. And, uh, and it's like his example didn't exist for me. I always, like, I was attracted to the corner bar. I, I, I remember when the door would open, wanting to look inside. Every time we, you know, we're walking up to the shopping center, um, there was an attraction there, and I didn't even know what it was. Um, I remember the first time I drank. I don't remember it changing how I felt, but what I remember was, it was, it was. Uh, we went three ways on a case of Genesee cream ale. Right? I think I was like 13 years old. We were back at the ball fields on the bleachers. Um, it was, I remember it was spring, it was spring. And after that night, I wanted everything. I wanted to experiment with everything there was. And by September, uh, I was in detox. Um, I was at this place called Oxford hospital. I went to detox there. I think I, I might've been 13. And there was a woman coming in and she was reading from the 12 and 12 to us. You know, there was like six of us in there at a time. And uh, of course I was the youngest. And she was reading and she kept saying, for me, this is what changed my life. Um, for me, this is where things all, all began. And, and like I kind of got what she was saying, but what I didn't, what I got from it was, well, the steps are what worked for her. I have to find my thing, I have to find what's gonna work for me. But by the time I was ready to leave detox, that, that was gone, man. That, there was no, you know, I, I was, I, I needed, I needed something exciting to ha be happening every single day at 13 years old. There was like seeing first things first on the wall and think, think, think and black and white pictures of Bob and, 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 uh, and Bill, that, like that was so boring to me. It was like there was, there was just no way, you know. I'm uh, okay. A uh, couple weeks of this, they'll forget about it. I'll go back to my routine, um, and that's what happened. And I, I drank in, every day until some. When they started collecting money for a case of beer on like uh, 
Wednesday night, I'm like, hey, that's a thing. We can drink during the week. We don't have to wait till the weekend. And, like, this isn't junior high school, you know. And uh, I would I would drink until I got in trouble, until I got called again. And then it was like, you better do something. I'm not, we're not going through this. My mother, you know, all the men on my mom's side of the family were alcoholics. I think they were on my dad's side, too. But I think the women on my mother's side suffered more. I think the, the bottoms might have been a little lower. They were in Al-Anon. And uh, my mom was not having it, man. She, you know, you're going to meetings. And uh, I heard a lot of it, you know. And, and I went back and forth through meetings my entire life after that first beer. Like, uh, you know, I, I was back and forth. And it was a string of rehabs, detoxes, uh, then outpatients, and still in and out with AA and... Uh, Sometimes there were serious attempts, you know, my last bottom was not my worst. There was, there was a time when I was 19, I was involved in an armed robbery. Um, somebody ended up snitching on us. People were getting locked up. I checked myself into a rehab uh, that was a court stipulated rehab at 2nd and Norris. It was called the firehouse. Um, I was the only person in there that wasn't stipulated in hopes that when I got locked up for it, I would have already been in place and maybe the judge would just let me write out my sentence there. And um, like it had to be God because think, crazy things happen and I didn't really know why, but there was another guy who burglarized the same place that we did an armed robbery at. And uh, he got arrested for something else and said, I know who did the armed robbery. and. They found his thumbprint in there, and they thought he was the third guy, and he got locked up for it um, because we were wearing masks. And uh, I was at, I was free. I like there was no way I was going to get locked up for this, so I left the rehab. You know, after like two months, and I was on the street. I got I got loaded one more day. Um, it was like 1984, and I, I really, I really wanted to stay sober after that one night of getting loaded again. And uh, I got involved, you know. I started attending meetings, and uh, I got involved with H and I work, and you know, I was, I was doing everything. But I really, like, I still, I didn't know, I still wasn't comprehending things. Um, like, I didn't know what turn it over meant. I heard people saying it all the time, like, just, you just got to turn it over. I still feel like getting loaded. You just got to turn that over. Are you turning it over? Yeah, I'm turning it over. And I had no idea what it meant, right? I, I, I didn't understand it. It didn't, I wasn't finding any relief in it. It seemed so elementary. People were just saying it like, you haven't turned it over? Like, like you're supposed to know, like, you know, like, and it just, it wasn't, wasn't wasn't doing it for me. Anyway, I ended up getting loaded, uh, and when I got loaded that run, it was bad. I uh, I woke up in a blackout in San Diego. Uh, from the blackout, I, I was in San Diego. Um, plane landing in San Diego is when I woke up, and uh, things got worse again there. You know. I was on the street there, um, tried to get sober there, put a couple, a little bit of time together. I was getting loaded. What would happen is I was getting loaded until I couldn't stand it anymore. And then I was getting sober, and I was staying sober until I couldn't stand being sober anymore. And then I was getting loaded again. Um, at one point, I managed to put like a year together in California, got enough money to get back to Philly, got back to Philly, met a girl got married, she had no idea, you know, because she kind of got blindsided, ambushed, really, because I was sober for a year, and then all of a sudden I started drinking, and, uh, you know, and then I had a little girl, too, and, you know, it was, it was a mess now. It just wasn't me, the train wreck anymore, you know. Now I was dragging these two into my nightmare. I got arrested with my daughter when she was, like, five, um, things were really bad, and, and I, here and there, I kept trying to get sober. 
long story short, wife and wife and daughter going. Um, I'm in Philly, and uh, I'm just I'm just a mess. Um, I got I'm homeless. I got evicted from the apartment I was in. They left, you know, and then I got evicted, and then. You know, again, my higher power, my grandmother was going into uh, a nursing home, and my dad's brother said to me, I don't want her house to be empty. You think you want to stay there for a little while? Yes, I want to stay there. Coincidentally, if you want to call it that, it was on Passmore Street in Mayfair. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but Passmore Street and Frankfurt Avenue is the intersection where a place called the Coffee Connection was, right? It was an AA hangout. And I would walk by there with my head down, cowering, you know, right over in the Tony's bar. Then I'd have a couple. Then I'd be coming out of the bar and I'd walk by. <laughs> Guys are assholes. I'm telling everybody at the coffee connection, you know, because I was fixed then, you know. I could pick my head up a little bit, you know. But um, I saw a guy in the Mayfair laundromat across the street one day. And I asked him if he wanted to, you know, what he had going on, just trying to get a hustle going. And he uh, he said he had 60 days. And this was a dude that I was using with. And uh, I was like, holy shit, 60 days. I said, Stay away from me then, dude. And uh, that was, I think that was like a Thursday or a Friday. That Monday, that Sunday night, I, I called him. I said, I, I, I want to go to a meeting. And uh, he took me to, I couldn't get off the couch till Thursday. Uh, I was detoxing and Thursday came, he took me to Penny Pack Group. I went to Penny Pack Group and I was like, this sucks. I can't believe I'm back here. I can't believe this is my life. I can't believe that this is what I have to do uh, to survive. And uh, I, I just, I was just so disgusted with myself, but I went back. I went back every day till the following Thursday, and by that Thursday, I, I was just overwhelmed with gratitude that I, I I was back. I was so happy I was back in AA. Um, but people were still saying stuff like I'm okay, I'm feeling okay in my own skin, and you know I was struggling, but I turned it over, and and I, I still had no idea what turning it over meant. You know, in the past. Uh, with my relapses, I thought AA didn't work for me. I thought the third step didn't work for me because there was, I, it just, I wasn't turning, it wasn't happening for me when I would say turn it over. I didn't understand. And then um, I went, I went to uh, another meeting and it was in the suburbs uh, in Bristol and there was a dude up there and he was doing a four step meeting and all of a sudden I found myself just like, laser beam focused on what he was saying it just it clicked he was talking about taking a four-step inventory and it wasn't like any other four step that i uh had wrote in a rehab or wherever he was talking about making a list and defects of character and the effect that your personalities had and and harboring resentments and all this shit and i knew i knew that was something i knew he was right i knew that was the solution but i still wasn't willing to take the solution um, I, uh, I had a car repoed that I was just mentioning. I had my electricity shut off. Um, a lot of stuff like that was still happening. There was still a lot of dysfunction going on in my life, sober. And, uh, I, I actually got a sponsor who wanted to take me through the steps and I never even heard that expression before. And he took me through the steps and he started explaining to me why I'm screwed, right? Why, like, I should be dead. That there's an allergy. I have this allergy. Uh, my body reacts differently to alcohol and there's no medical cure for it. And uh, I always knew I was an alcoholic, but I didn't know uh, the extent of that. I didn't know anything about the phenomenon craving. I knew I didn't feel restless, irritable, and discontented every time I got loaded. I knew I did things and became absent when I was getting loaded that I needed to get loaded again to just to make myself. I would get loaded behind shit that I did on the load because I couldn't handle it. It would turn my stomach. Um, he explained to me about my higher power and 
my higher power, when he explained it to me, I really didn't have much of a relationship with it. It was an idea. It was the power of the universe for me, and it still is, I kind of think. Um, but when I got the three, I finally realized, you know, him explaining to me that step three was really, you know, uh, thoughts and actions, right? It, you know, uh, turning my will and my life over were my thoughts and my actions. And it also, he explained to me the third step at that point was just a decision because I really wasn't capable of using my higher power at that point, right? He, it, that, and that was the problem. It wasn't working for me because I was so blocked off. I was so angry. I had so much anger and resentment that there was no way I was going to make a connection with my higher power. It might have got me through a couple nights here and there. But I, I, I tell you, man, I remember putting my hand up in a meeting saying, I want to get loaded so bad. I want to get loaded. Um, and people give me the phone list, you know, and, and you know, yeah, I'm turning it over and praying to God that I don't and saying, yeah, 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 I'll meet you at the diner. And pew, gone after the meeting, you know, just I, I remember that. And when I started going through the steps, see, nobody ever explained to me that I really couldn't do what step three was, you know, asking us to do until I got to step 10, right? It was just, it was just really an expression of my willingness to keep moving. And, uh, you know, that made all the sense in the world at that point. You know, I, I still... I didn't understand the power of a resentment, but I knew that it wasn't working for me. Step three wasn't working for me at that point. So I knew there had to be more to it as we kept going. And, uh, and I was, when we got to page 63, man, I was blown away by what was on there because it was like my childhood. It was like, you know, an extreme example of self-will run riot. That was like just, like I could see like looking back at it now I could see my mother my father my brother and sister and things tranquil at home until I, I walked in the room and then it was just chaotic and by by no like well, I didn't intentionally try to start stuff or stir stuff up I just it kind of just happened you know like I, my my personality was just I guess so obnoxious at that point you know um, which must have been crazy for my mom and dad because they were probably wondering where they got it from. My brother and sister, our disposition was totally different, you know, and uh, yeah, I could just see a lot, a lot of it uh, there. A lot of what would happen in the third step in my life as a, as a, as a child. Um, as I went through the rest of the steps, though, the third step was becomes becomes everything, right? Uh, went through four. I got rid of that anger and resentment. I dumped it in, in my fifth step. Uh, started working on six and seven. And dealt with guilt and remorse in eight and nine. And then in ten, uh, when I see spiritual awakening in the book, or I hear somebody th talk about it, it immediately takes me back to making an amends to at my ex-wife's house, in her living room with the dude she's with now, or was with at the time. Uh, I made my amends to him, and I had that spiritual awakening right there in her living room. And when I did that, I realized I had the power of the third step at that point. My, my thoughts were changing, my actions were changing, right? The psychic change was taking place. And it was taking place because I was connected. I really felt connected. I really felt tapped in. I really felt like I understood what the third step was talking about at that time. And I really didn't know for, for so many years. It was such a relief. And I find that when I'm sitting down with guys, none of them, almost, ever, almost all of them, have no idea what the third step means. I mean, I think we're all so confused by it. I mean, it, like to me, I don't even hear make a decision. Right? I don't hear make a decision. I hear, I got to do what? Turn my will, my life? Or what? Like, I, like in the book where it says, what does that look like? I mean, 
really, what, what, is, what is my life going to be like at that point? Especially when you're 16 or 17 or 20 or even 40. When I got here at 40, I was just like, man. When I surrendered at 40, though, this time, I knew there was going to be some of that involved with AA, and I was ready. I was like, okay, whatever it is, man, I'm willing to do it. I was, I was beaten. I was truly done, you know. Um, the thing about being truly done, though, is <laughs> if you don't act on it at that window, you know, truly done doesn't hang around much, you know. If you don't get to work... When you're willing to do it all, the longer you stay sober, the less you'll be interested in doing the work. And uh, I did the work, man. I did the work, and then uh, my sponsor told me I had to teach this to people, and immediately I, I did get started on that. I'm, I'm dyslexic. It's hard for me to read. It's hard for me to comprehend. But over time... Started highlighting stuff in my book like everybody does. But I started writing notes, and I started memorizing what I was reading. And uh, at the beginning, it was humbling because sometimes the guy I'm trying to take through the steps was explaining to me what the words were saying, you know, um, because I I didn't I couldn't I couldn't read it, you know. Um, but. Uh, When I got to step 12, every time I took somebody back through the steps and I got on the third step, every, every time, and even still today, every time we go through the third step, the third step gets a little deeper. I have a better understanding of what it is. And it was told to me that once you start teaching this stuff, you really start knowing it. You really don't know it now as you're going through it. And I really didn't understand what that meant at the time, but I certainly do now. Um, uh I don't know, I kind of feel like I got off the third step a little bit, but um, I, that's all I got. Thank you. Uh, please limit your sharing to three minutes. Uh, please keep your shares related to the step. If you feel like drinking or if you had a drink today, please see me or speak to someone after the meeting. We ask that you please refrain from the use of profanity. We are in a church and on a spiritual journey. I open up the meeting. Anybody want to share?